there she is. There she is, right there. Oh my God. Finding evidence of extraterrestrial visits has become an obsession of the age. Part of a collective fantasy or proof that we are not alone. 10% of Americans have seen these things. That's 26 million people. A similar number in the United Kingdom have. Uh, I personally, uh, you know, really I'm a doctor from North Carolina. I do emergency medicine. But I'm interested in this because when I was quite young, I saw one of these things in broad daylight silent metallic disc floating along. No question in my mind these are real. Central Mexico. A team of sky watchers led by Dr. Stephen Greer prepares for yet another encounter with a UFO. We came here for the purpose of observing them and if we can to try to signal to them and get them if possible to land in a field or near us or hover nearby. Uh, it's our intent to be able to communicate if we can to the fullest degree possible. Night scopes. And they magnify the ambient light about 30,000 times. So in other words, at night when the starlight and you have no moon, it, it magnifies the ambient light. And frequently if we see an object that we're wondering if it's extraterrestrial origin, we'll be able to get a, get a good fix on this and see if there are any aviation lights on it or anything, and it's, it's very, very sensitive. And we have a million candle power light for nearby signaling here. We set these strobes out during the event in Mexico. One thing I didn't share with you, which is very important, is that it illuminated the whole leading edge of this huge triangle. You can imagine a massive triangle the size of three football fields. The whole leading front edge of it became a light that was lining out when we did this. We've had these tones played back to us in field work before, in many locations. Come through, they'll come through a circle like this. You'll hear this doo 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 doo. Suddenly, a sighting. Oh, did you see that? Well, I saw it. There it is. Oh, there now it is. look, look at it. It's flashing, it's jumping. But it jumped all over. Yes, it did. Did you see that? It, it was yes, left. Did. Oh. Boy, what a great but view. That it, you know, we were just talking about how something always happens at this something time unusual. of night. Yeah, well, so there it is. Seeing UFOs may now be routine for some, but it's only in the last 50 years that it's become such a habit. It all started one afternoon on the 24th of June, 1947. Kenneth Arnold, a private pilot, was scanning the Cascade Mountains in Washington State, USA looking for a crashed transport plane. Arnold suddenly glimpsed nine disc-shaped objects flying in formation. When Arnold reported his sighting, a journalist coined the term flying saucer. They, uh, they seem to kind of weave in and out right above the mountaintop. And uh, I would say that they even went down into the canyons in several instances, or probably a hundred feet. To my knowledge, there isn't anything that I read about that would go that fast. As news broke of the UFO sighting, thousands of people began to see strange lights and objects in the sky. see it above and ahead of me I'm trying to close in for a better look this is Captain Willis Sperry an airline pilot giving an official account of his sighting of unknowns the object was flying head-on at us it was 50 times the magnitude of the brightest star pilots are particularly good witnesses for many reasons 
First of all, their motivation to become pilots in the first place. They like to be up there in the sky. They like to uh, be in control. They have command authority. And for a senior captain of an airliner, for instance, he has to make proper judgments at all times. A psychologist who specializes in perception, Haynes has spent 10 years collecting pilots' accounts and photographs of UFOs. When something strange happens, they can evaluate it. They don't just accept it blindly. And because their career might be on the line, they won't report something unless they've already thought through the possibilities of what it might be. And if they've eliminated everything else and they're left with a UFO, then they will report a UFO. Credible witnesses continue to describe close encounters with mysterious objects. We're inside the cockpit of a Boeing 737 over the southern Andes of Argentina. The UFO was here, static. Initially, we thought it was moving towards us. But as we got closer to our turning point, the lights on the UFO became brighter. I was concerned and began signaling to the object with our own lights. The lights on the UFO then dipped as if it was responding to us. I just didn't know what to make of it. The pilot alerted ground control. The captain reported a strong light coming towards him. I told him several times that we had no knowledge of any aircraft in his path. As we were preparing to land, just before touchdown, there was a power cut and all the runway lights disappeared. I then had to take the decision to abort the landing. Suddenly, all the equipment in the control tower goes crazy. The wind gauge goes out of control. Other equipment, which should have been off after the power cut, suddenly starts flashing, on and off. Near the airport, a retired police officer witnessed the unfolding drama. The UFO was a bright orangey colour, with small flashing lights around the sides that glowed like a welding torch. It was a huge light that glided off towards the lake. My colleague and I looked out and saw that behind the 737 there was indeed a large intense light that seemed to accompany the jet towards the lake. The UFO appears to be waiting for me, hovering above the middle of the lake. It allows me to fly over it, and then it glides off over the mountains. That's when it disappears. After this experience, I now have to think that we are not alone in this universe. And that we are going to have to open our minds and prepare for a completely different way of seeing ourselves.
The files of documents describing UFO sightings by pilots increase every year. To Dick Haynes, pilots' testimonies are clear evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. When you talk to enough military pilots and they say there's nothing I could have done to get away from that object, or I went to fire a, a missile at one and it wouldn't fire, my missile system wouldn't fire, that begins to raise some fundamental questions. It, it makes you a little uneasy, I think. And I can understand why many of my colleagues don't want to study this, this subject. It, um, it forces us to, to adopt a larger view of things. But now we don't just have to rely on the credibility of witnesses. Skywatchers are armed with a new weapon, the camera. What flashes or flies or just falls with style ends up on video. The skies above Bonnie Bridge in Scotland, scene of the most recent wave of sightings in Britain. My friend and I um, arrived here to take photographs for a, a college project that we were on. And uh, over beside the, the pylons, the two flashing pylons over at Kincardine, power station, um, we noticed two small lights, what we assumed to be a helicopter or a plane. Um, as we were watching it, it moved over towards Grangemouth Stadium and it hovered for about a minute. And then what we noticed was the lights, what we thought were turned off, actually the object turned round and the lights were on the other side of it. And uh, from there, what happened was it tipped and swooped and then flew directly over our heads. And I pointed the camera up to the sky and pressed the button. And um, the photograph that I did actually get was quite spectacular. Two miles away, the Malcolm family has been plagued for months by strange fluttering lights in the sky. We were driving along this main road just behind me and my dad pointed out the car and he says, look what's that, it's in the farmer's field. So I stopped the car and the two of us jumped out and we looked at this object, it just appeared out of no place and it was like the size of a jumbo jet. I mean, I, I can't, you can't really explain the shape of it because it was so light, it was a brilliant white light on it and it was, you couldn't get a shape in it. It was possibly about jumbo jet size, eh? Oh, it was massive. And it stopped again, and two white sphere objects came out the side of it. And one especially came really close to the car. And that, I must admit, caused a slight panic. The next thing, the two smaller objects went back into the bigger object, and it just totally vanished. I mean, it didn't go up or down or sideways, it just, like, disappeared. This is one of the many videos of a UFO filmed by the family. The Malcolms have even built a special platform where they keep a vigil of the heavens. The Malcolms' first encounter a light chased the eldest son, Neil, on his way home one night. He rushed terrified into the house. One of the family caught the light on video. To this day, Neil is disturbed by the incident. He's terrified. He won't talk to anybody, really, about anything. Well, I think, one, he feels silly, and two, I think, if he doesn't get involved, it maybe didn't really happen at all. Let me say out of mind. He doesn't want to know, so maybe it'll just I'll go away. But, but it's not gonna go away, it just keeps coming back. All we've seen is weird objects flying about in the sky. Lights doing various acrobatics in the sky, like going side to side, up and down. No aircraft could do any kind of things. And 
basically all we want is somebody just to turn around and say, right, there is something happening. And just explain to us what it is and then fine, we'll back off, no problem. It's just something you see, definitely an aircraft or test now or whatever, I don't know. What could these lights be? Neil finally agreed to describe what happened. It was huge, far bigger than the car, and uh, so I just came flying down the road, came into the yard, and it was absolutely massive. So I jumped out of the car, and it was still hovering above the yard. So I ran in and told the rest of the family. They all thought I had been in a crash or something, the state I came in. And uh, then they all ran out. I said, is it still there? I said, come out and see it. So they all ran out. And sure enough, there it was, still there. What so, was it? I have no idea. I have no idea at all. Since 1990, over 2,000 people in the Bonnie Bridge area have reported sightings of UFOs, making them an issue for the local council. A lot of people that came forward initially were ridiculed, and these people have great courage, but they're still seeing these th objects in the sky, and they're looking for an answer. And me being the local councillor, they think that I can provide it, and unfortunately I can't. But I'm trying hard to bring somebody forward, like the Ministry of Defence, or somebody that's got the expertise to come into the area and provide an answer to all these things that's going on. But in 1991, the Belgian authorities were just as confused as the UFO watchers. Hundreds of people were seeing strange craft in their airspace. The Belgian Air Force scrambled fighter jets to intercept the unidentified craft that appeared on radar screens only to vanish. Was this what everyone had been waiting for? Clear evidence of extraterrestrial visits. Perhaps not. At that very time, the US Air Force was carrying out tests of its latest war machine over Europe. Stealth, the ultimate fighter, probably caused the panic. In Nevada, USA, photojournalist Mark Farmer isn't waiting for official answers. He investigates UFOs his way. I'm Agent X, and I'm here on a dirt strip in Alamo, Nevada. I'm about ready to take an airplane now to Area 51. Take a look inside what is America's most secret air base. We're flying over these mountains out into the Tickaboo Valley, and we're going to fly right along the restricted line of Area 51 right to the east of that restricted line and right to the north, and we'll come back and we'll get some, get some good shots of the base. Mark Farmer's persona as Agent X isn't just for fun. His mission is to penetrate Area 51, the most secret military base in the world. The US Air Force denies that the base even exists. Is it because they're hiding proof that ET has paid us a visit? Agent X assesses his latest mission into Area 51. 
even he doesn't buy all the legend. The pilots um, that, that use these airspaces refer to this as the box. And I've talked to a few of them. A lot of, some of them like to come through this place here, Coyote Summit, and pop up as high as they can real quickly so they can just look over and see what's in there, then they go back down. But uh, it just goes to show that even the normal guys with top secret clearance with access to some of the uh, you know, highest technology, cutting edge aircraft that are out there are not even allowed to take a peek or talk about it. Uh, as far as the stories with all the aliens, I mean, there are a couple compelling tales. Uh, unfortunately, even the most compelling tales and, and the best eyewitnesses, of which, you know, myself, I've seen a couple UFOs out here, um, there's no evidence to indicate that anything is alien. There's no burden of proof here to indicate that uh, we're reverse engineering anything, that we're in possession of alien technology, or, or that we're flying, flying saucers around. You know, it all comes down to... Uh, Where's the disc? For many, the disc had landed in Roswell, New Mexico, in 1947. The US Air Force announced that it had recovered a crashed spaceship in a remote ranch. Hours later, they claimed it was only a weather balloon. But by then, it was too late. This book by a retired Air Force major increased the public's distrust of official explanations. Major Keyhole, as author of the book Flying Saucers Are Real, what is your opinion of these new sightings of unidentified objects? With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. When you deal with something like Roswell, I mean, you have to look in the time. This is after the second global war. This is very close to what is the only atomic bomber base in the world. Uh, we are faced with a foe, the Soviet Union, that we don't know what it's doing. Something falls from the sky, whether or not it was Project Mogul, whether or not it was a weather balloon, whether or not it was extraterrestrial in nature, something did happen there. We are in the radar room at National Airport, Washington, D.C., on July 26, 1952. For the first time, unidentified flying objects have been sighted over the nation's capital. In the Cold War, fear of Soviet invasion seized the American public. I see them. Everyone looked up to the heavens for signs of a nuclear apocalypse. They're all around me. They're moving in on me. They're coming closer. UFOs became invaders, and they were often tinted red. They're coming right at me. Gee whiz! Invaders from Mars. He saw them land from outer space. He saw them capture innocent people only to destroy. <laughs> Invaders from Mars, capturing humans at will for their own sinister purposes, turning them into diabolical instruments of destruction. In the 1950s, America's science fiction films were very much about the alien, about the threat of being taken over by some foreign power. And that alien was conceived in much the same way we conceived communism, as hierarchical, as group mind, as rigid, as disciplined, as impersonal, as emotionless, as an unstoppable force that is going to take us over and destroy us. In the communist Soviet Union, the military were also obsessed with the threat of invasion. Today, top military personnel can reveal that UFOs were sometimes mistaken for a US attack. Zvozny, a town for cosmonauts and their families. Colonel Marina Popovich was a test pilot at the height of the Cold War. Должны были вестись учебные стрельбы. Летит 
On one occasion, we were carrying out nighttime target practice. We check the performance of our instruments and try to bring down the target plane. Suddenly, the screen on the display lights up and we think it's the target plane that should be two kilometers away. As the sights are being aligned, the screen lights up again, but this time the object is huge and really bright and it's moving straight towards us. It could not have been the target plane, and for a moment we were about to open fire. We were in a MiG-21 and the object was so close, collision looked unavoidable. But suddenly, the UFO tipped on its edge and in a flash moved off the screen. We had recorded the encounter on film, and I have these photographs. They are stunning, and I'll never forget the experience. A close encounter with a UFO that could have led to world war. During the 1950s, many other sightings of UFOs caused stage one military alerts. The Cold War is over but the USA continues to monitor space for signs of a missile attack. This is Space Command, a gigantic complex under Cheyenne Mountain in New Mexico, the nerve center of US space intelligence. We know what's up in space, we track it, and we have many space support missions. If we have a missile launch any place in the world, the first thing that happens is, is our space assets, a satellite, sees the, the booster on that missile light. After 30 seconds to about a minute and a half, the satellites will tell me if that's in fact a missile, the direction it's going, and it'll give me a, a basic indication of uh, what areas of the world may or may not be threatened by that. And we provide the national command authorities, the president and secretary of defense and their counterparts in Canada, with a picture of what's going on so that they can uh, make the appropriate decisions. Many ufologists believe that Space Command has already tracked extraterrestrial visits. Well, occasionally, you know, we get, uh, we get calls right here in the Cheyenne Mountain direct to the command center or the Space Control Center that uh, reports an unidentified flying object. Uh, we try to treat all the callers with, with respect that we should because I've never had a crank call. They're all sincere. Uh, and aside from my personal beliefs uh, about uh, UFOs and uh, uh, space beings and other universes, uh, I can tell you that we've never seen any evidence to that here in Cheyenne Mountain. Space Command ultimate sky watcher, peering into the immensity of space 24 hours a day. Even the hard-nosed US military wonder what could be out there. I believe that uh, we don't know what we don't know yet, and that uh, most anything is, is possible on the continuum of possibilities, and that there's a whole lot more to learn. It was only three decades ago that we first saw the insignificance of our planet from the black void of space. It was a giant leap for mankind, one that helped us realize there were bigger things than our conflicts on Earth. When you're breaking through the atmosphere and the sun is setting before your eyes, the colors are indescribable. You begin to feel that you're living in a fantasy world, surrounded by an unnatural harmony of color. Then you forget that you are human. You simply become part of what you see. Russian film of cosmonaut Konyakov training. 
To date, over 300 humans have ventured into space. The pictures and recollections they brought back have had a profound effect. I can't believe that in the vastness of our galaxy, we are alone in this boundless cosmos. I think there are other forms of life and that, with the help of space programs, sooner or later a meeting will indeed happen. Thanks to the space race, journeying to other planets is no longer a flight of fancy, but a vision of things to come. One of the most popular shows in Russia today is UFO Extra, a weekly report of UFO experiences. For the last eight years since Glasnost, our program has had a great following. The general audience in Russia is fascinated by the subject and anything to do with the spiritual and the unknown. Alexander Miyakchenkov travels all over the former Soviet Union investigating UFO sightings. With the fall of communism and the revival of religion, UFOs are no longer seen as threatening invaders, but as spiritual messengers from the heavens. In 1984, a young couple in New York had an extraordinary experience. There's nothing in the world that will ever change you or affect you the way something like what happened to us, because it wasn't a fast light going by. We were singled out and allowed to view this thing and to let it show us, for whatever reason, how stunning, how magnificent, how advanced and how mysterious these folks are. We were on a Brooklyn Queens Expressway and as we were heading toward the exit ramp to Metropolitan Avenue, Denise had noticed this strange red light in the sky. I really didn't pay much attention to it until suddenly the, the entire thing lit up and we found ourselves standing underneath this UFO. It was the most astonishing and shocking spectacle imaginable because we did focus and pinch ourselves and go, oh my God, this is a UFO, this is one of these, you know, flying saucers. And it was unmistakable. It stayed there, very radiant, very beautiful, very imposing and um, totally silent. We've not yet been able to crack the meaning. I think people just get so blown away and they start adding so much to it. Um, it's hard almost to take it at face value because it's, it's so overwhelming. There is a definite reason why they approach folks. I think Close Encounters spoke to a rising need within the American society, and perhaps more broadly than that, for the mystical, for the spiritual. We've seen a breakdown of the church and its role in, in society, a loss of the mystical forces of the universe, as, at least as they were understood within traditional religion. And yet there's a hunger to touch the spiritual, to touch the mythological. And I think Close Encounters spoke to that by having a mythological encounter between human beings and aliens. I think uh, that's part of what happens when people do meet, a do have these alien sightings, is that in one way or another they're looking in their lives 
for something that's larger than they are, that's a larger force in their community. That hunger for the spiritual, I think, governs an awful lot of the, the very sightings and mythology around the alien, and has, has particularly since the 70s forward. In recent years, our close encounters have become even closer. Alien abduction. Bud Hopkins, a successful artist and self-appointed abduction expert, is using hypnotic regression to help this woman recall her experience of alien abduction. Suddenly there's this light that, op that opens up from the bottom. And we move into the light and we float up into the ship. The size of this is enormous, and that's one of the most disturbing things about it, because uh, it, it works against its credibility, even, that it can be so many people. How can so many people be involved? But when we did a survey through the Roper organization using uh, questions that, would, that were indicative of abduction experiences, for instance, have you ever seen balls of light inside your bedroom or in your house? Have you ever lost a period of an hour or more, you had no idea where you were or how or why it happened? And we said that people would have to have said yes to four out of five of these indicator questions, these symptoms, uh, to uh, suggest that they are likely to have had abduction experiences. And that worked out to 2% of the population. It was in uh, December of 91, and I was returning to the farm from visiting my family lived about 50 miles away and i had seen something very strange in the sky it looked like uh, there were a plane that was in trouble and it was much too low but it was sufficiently alarming for me to need to pull off the road to have a better look at it uh, i was suddenly then uncomfortable and i wanted to run <laughs> but i couldn't move In the blink of an eye, I, I was surrounded by light, um, and I remembered nothing. My next conscious memory was being back in the vehicle, which I had parked and left on the side of the road, five miles away from where I had been, driving around the corner, going much too fast on two wheels. A few years ago, near Edinburgh, two friends, Colin and Gary, were driving along when they saw an object hovering above the road. It was black and shiny in colour. It had a distinct metallic look about it. It looked a solid, crafty, some form. Whatever it is, I've no idea. It was just there. We had no choice but to, to go underneath it. So we basically just, just went for it. So I put the crash the gearbox in my car down into second gear. I accelerated like mad. I must have picked up to about 50, 60 mile an hour. There was no way I was stopping. Just as we were going underneath the object, you could start to make it the bottom of it and it dropped like a shimmering curtain of light. And then suddenly, I'm not in my car. I'm thinking, where's my car? Where's Colin? And I'm, I'm looking all around about me and I'm like in a void of blackness. And I'm thinking, where am I? And then, just sitting looking about, I thought, am I dead? When we started looking into one case after another and found that what the people remembered consciously was uh, a pretty traumatic abduction experience, 
which then intersected with dreams that they had had, as they explained, uh, well, I used to dream about that thing afterwards, uh, etc. You begin to find the evidence accumulating that these are real experiences. We'd wake up with scratches. Just scratches. New uh, scars on our bodies. In fact, missing we got, contact lenses. Oh. Wake up with your eyes completely shut. You couldn't open them because your corneas were scratched. Bloody noses. Yeah, a lot of blood on the pillow. We'd wake up with bloody, grass in Bloody the ears. Dirty feet when you yeah. knew you'd taken a shower the night before. That's wonderful. Oh. In Virginia, Beth and Anna contacted Bud Hopkins. Under hypnosis, they relived their experiences and made drawings of their encounters. The only part that would seem real was this. Most psychologists think alien abduction is fantasy, but Bud Hopkins thinks the similarities between the claims proves they're true. The figures turn up, small figures with large heads and huge black eyes. The person is then floated out of wherever they are, through the windshield of the car, through the window of the house, and up, usually, some kind of beam of light into the craft. They are calmed down all the time. Uh, you'll be all right. You won't be hurt. They're put on a table, and there's a systematic uh, series of physical procedures that take place that finally end up concentrating on the reproductive organs, especially removing ova samples from women and sperm samples from men. In Scotland, Colin and Gary also underwent hypnosis. And I saw these three creatures coming up towards the vehicle of the car, and I couldn't move, and I just absolute terror in my face. And then suddenly I'm in some form of place, like a room or somewhere, and I'm on a platform, and I. I could see I could see that I had uh, no clothes on, and there seemed to be these creatures. There were small ones and big ones, and it's like they were interested in the physical aspects of my body. I have memories of the aliens taking fetuses from my body, of showing me the fetuses. They are obviously children of some sort. They do not look wholly human. They do not look wholly alien. There's a possibility they could be some sort of species cross, although with what I know of biology, that makes it hard to accept that. But I also believe that they may be thoroughly human, but Genetically since, altered in some way. Genetically altered in some After. way. And just raised, gestated outside the womb. At Harvard University, Professor of Psychiatry John Mack has invited controversy and ridicule by taking alien abduction seriously. If you meet with the people themselves, you realize that they're people who are quite healthy. Uh, these ideas, even though they're outlandish to us, they are distinguished fr from delusion by the fact that the people themselves question this. They, they doubt it. They have an appropriate attitude toward the phenomenon. If it's a fantasy, it's the wrong fantasy. I want a fun fantasy. I don't want one that scares me, and I don't want one that I can't explain, and I don't want one that I can't tell my next door neighbor about. We have to get over the ridicule, the automatic uh, dismissal of this, and we have to be open-minded enough to say, let's look into us. Because if this is true, it's the biggest event in human history. I know what I saw, and I know what I saw was real. And I didn't care what anybody says. I was just like an answer to it all. This phenomenon suggests, A, we're not the highest intelligence in the universe, and B, in a certain sense, we're, we're not alone. So it, 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 uh, this phenomenon is breaking us out of that notion. But it's not the only thing that's doing that. I mean, there are increasing attention to shamanic uh, cultures that have never felt we were alone. Uh, there's increasing emphasis on spiritual practices which uh, take much more seriously the reality of, of, of other kinds of, of beings. Mexico is a very magical, mythical, legendary country. That is why probably people is more open and ready to accept that what we cannot understand now. The Aztecs believe 
that after every eclipse there was a new era and they considered themselves the children of the fifth son. That would make us the children of the sixth son. The ancient Aztecs and Mayans of Mexico believed their ancestors had been visited by extraterrestrial beings. The forthcoming eclipse would mark the beginning of the age when they would return. They mention in this prophecy they have that under the era of the sixth sun, everything that was buried and hidden would be discovered. In 1991, an entire nation held its breath. In the following weeks, Mexicans reported a record number of UFO sightings. As the furor increased, Mao San went live on his regular TV show and asked the nation to look up to the skies. It was so important, this show, that lasted from 11 o'clock at night until 10.30 in the morning without stopping. And it was a, a celebration. Everybody remembers that program. Everybody recorded that program. And we had the full participation of the public. Nobody went to sleep that night. And then is when everything started. A UFO invasion, atmospheric phenomena, or creative camera work. Whatever the truth, belief turned into a reality for millions of people who concluded, we are not alone. Over a thousand videos poured in. In the national hysteria, any blip in the sky became evidence of the arrival of the extraterrestrials. On Thursday, a new vision of the universe, teeming with aliens. Meditating Irishmen who vector in spaceships. Implants left in bodies after alien abduction. Interdimensional portholes. And the Hopi Indian dance of the universe.